Okay, you're right. Okay. Okay. All right, what we're going to be looking at is the first resurrection that's referred to by the Lord as the regeneration. We're going to start off in Psalm 17, verse 15. Here we have David, the psalmist, writing, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. So uh, from this passage, we have an Old Testament saint looking forward to a resurrection where he uses the phrase, I will awake from sleep, in a sense, to thy likeness. Uh, it's interesting, he says, I will behold thy face in righteousness, which gives me some idea that as he is resurrected, he's righteous. And he's, uh, he's I, I'm not quite sure if he's making this statement. It sounds like he's, he could also be saying he's beholding Christ that's righteous, and that's why I'm raised. You know, it could go either way there. But I like the fact he says, I shall be satisfied. And it kind of gives you the idea of finally, like Paul says, we groan in this body, longing for that we would be, you know, clothed with our tabernacle. All right, I want you to uh, go to Job chapter 19 and verse 22. Uh, this is a, a good old familiar passage. Um, Job, of course, here is, he, he was really under the gun. I mean, he was going through what most people, if you've got some stuff going on in your life, you've had some tragedy or whatever, there's going to be a group of people that will gather around and say, you must be doing something wrong because God's punishing you, mm -hmm. okay? And that's really not the case here. Uh, there's actually a war going on between Lucifer and the Lord, and uh, basically Job is caught in the middle here. Uh, but he had some people that were giving him a hard time, and he says, um, here we go, Why do you perse persecute me as God and are not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. And, and we're reading about that right now in, in the book. They were written down. Uh, he says that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin and worms destroy this body, Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Okay, so from just two passages, uh, we see from David, uh, he says he will stand on the earth, and he will see him. So. We see just from these two passages here, the Lord will, or Christ, is promised to come back to the earth. David said that I will awake into his likeness, and Job says I will stand in my flesh, even though my flesh has been eaten up by worms, somehow I will stand and see him. All right? Now, uh, we've got a problem here, though. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. Get uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 50, and Psalms 16, 8, and, and get those two together. <clears throat> now this will dispel anyone that thinks that they can probably be good enough to stand and see the Lord. He says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. What he's saying here is this kingdom that's coming over here, and that would include heaven, this kingdom 
Flesh and blood cannot go into that kingdom. Okay? So, the problem with, even if you could live a perfect life, follow the commandments to a T, you still have flesh and blood that's been tainted by the fall, and you are not able to go into that kingdom. That has to be fixed. And that's what this, uh, this resurrection is all about. Now, let's go to Psalms chapter 16 and verse 8. This is a prophecy related to the Lord Jesus Christ or to Christ. Uh, and it gives us some indication as to how flesh and blood would be able to somehow make it into the kingdom. He says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. And what, I'm, what I believe is going on here is David, as he said, I will awake in thy likeness back in the Psalms. He's also seeing Christ at the right hand of the Father resurrected. And because he's at his right hand, he knows that somehow he will be able to be at the right hand of the Father. He says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. And that's a reference to being able to rest in the kingdom ages and even further. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, uh, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, if you remember the story about the rich man and Lazarus, uh, Lazarus went into paradise, which was under the earth, right? And the rich man died and woke up in hell. Now, when he says, I will, you will not leave my soul in hell, what he's making a reference to there is those saints that were in paradise, they were, in a sense, even though it was a place of rest, they were stuck there until the Lord would be resurrected somehow and get them out of that place, okay? Uh, for a person, and this might even be where some believe in a purgatory, that you could somehow get out of there from this passage, those that didn't go to hell, they're there, and they will be there till the uh, the great white throne judgment which we'll talk about here later but that's what he's talking about there and this is a prophecy the Lord went into the heart of the earth for how many days three three days three nights and while he was down there he preached and he <laughs> probably talked to Abraham in his bosom and said guys I'm getting ready to get y'all out of here okay uh, he says thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is full of fullness of joy. At thy right hand there, shall, there are pleasures forevermore. Sounds like a, a good place to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in the resurrection, doesn't it? All right, now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and to verse 42. <clears throat> All right. Now, just as a note here, what we just read about, we have the cross here. And he was buried, and for three days he was in the heart of the earth, or in hell, as it were. And uh, he was resurrected out of there, okay? And it says here, uh, Paul is saying, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Now, let's go back to where Job said. He said, though my worms destroy this body, that's what he's talking about being in weakness. We have no ability to stop death for ourselves. We have no ability to, in a sense, keep death from destroying our body, even though they put you in a... Uh, what's it called, a mausoleum, and seal you back in there, mm -hmm. death is going to get to your body. That's what he's talking about, the, this idea of uh, corruption. The body it begins to decay. We can't stop that, all right? But according to this resurrection, Job, David all died. Their bodies have basically corrupted, decayed to... Maybe there's not even anything left of them. But at this resurrection, he says it will be raised in incorruption. Uh, it will be raised in glory. 
and be raised in power. All right, now let's go um, to Psalm chapter 49 and verse 14. Just to further illustrate what Paul says uh, here in Psalms 49, 14, like sheep they have laid, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. Okay, now, basically he's saying again, all the Old Testament saints, they've died, they've been put into a grave. Uh, death is feeding on their physical body, if you will. But, he says, they shall be the morning. The morning here is a reference to this event of the second coming of Jesus Christ. When the bright and shining star comes back. Okay? And he says, notice here, beauty shall consume them in the grave from their dwelling place. All right. Now let me first say this as we're looking at this. I don't believe that when a person dies and their body goes into the grave that they're just dormant laying there for thousands of years having no consciousness or being at presence with the Lord. Some people believe in, in this idea of soul sleep where when you die you just lay in a grave and eventually only when you're resurrected do you have consciousness again? I believe that you are pre your soul is present with the Lord. You're conscious of His presence. All right. Now, uh, let's go. Uh, let's go to Romans chapter eight and verse nineteen. For Psalms forty nine talks about a beautiful thing that happens in the grave. Paul makes a reference to this in Romans eight nineteen. He says. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. This right here. This resurrection. There is a rapture, if you will, that takes place. Uh, and we'll, we'll see more about that in a minute. But there is this idea of the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. And let me just say what I think he's saying there. I could be wrong, but I'm thinking he's, there's a reason that when we die, we die in shame, in a sense of physical, and we have no power, in the, in the sense that Christ, when he was resurrected, he had all authority that we got that those people could have been raised and it all could have been over with there. But he has a plan and purpose. There are saints that are yet to be uh, saved. Time has to play out. And that's why we're subjected to this situation. You know, I think every one of us, if we had the opportunity, even though we love the people down here, I would much rather be in a new body. <laughs> Uh, and then having to deal with all the stuff that we have to deal with down here, right? Uh, but Paul says, he was even talked about this question, he says, it would be better to go and be with the Lord. This is far better, but the reason that I'm down here is for the church, for the elect, for the ministry, okay? We have a ministry. Okay, now let's go back. He says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of, there's that word again, corruption, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, and that includes the animals, that includes plant life, you know, plants die, animals die, uh, and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits, and, and make a note, mental note of that word first fruits, because we're going to come back to that, of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, 
to wit the redemption of our body. Now here's what he's talking about. This here, there is a redemption of a body. Okay? That happens and it's related to the first fruits of the Spirit. Alright? Uh, now let's go to 1 John Chapter 3 and verse 1. Why don't you turn around? Some water. Okay. All right, now, first John. Now, we all know that John preached. What gospel? Can anybody tell me what type of gospel that John preached? Circumcision. The gospel of the circumcision. And we know from looking at the at their ministry, they were looked clearly from their ministry, they were looking for this right here. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament saints, the Lord said he confirmed the promises. What have we seen? A waken to his likeness, that they would stand on the earth at this particular day. They don't know when it would come, they just knew it was coming, right? And the Lord talked about, you know, being delivered unto the Gentiles, that he would on the third day be raised, and they understood and were looking for his second coming. John says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Sounds like Paul and John are talking about the same thing here, right? He says, therefore, the world knoweth us not because it kneweth not, or knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear. Sounds like Paul saying, we, we long for this appearance that he's talking about. We shall be, uh, but we, we, what we shall be, I guess is what he's saying. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Sounds like what David said back here, right? He will awake to his likeness. When will this happen? When he shall appear. Right? All right. We know that to be the second coming here. All right. Uh, let's go uh, to Psalms. Chapter 49 and verse 15. Uh, 49 verse 15. Here's that word redemption or redeem again. Now we know that redeem has this idea of this. I come to you. Let's say I come to It's kind of like layaway. Right? I mean, that's kind of an idea about it. Uh, you go and you say, I want that bicycle for my kid for Christmas. Okay? And I'm going to give you half the money, as it were. Or maybe I get, no, it's more, I guess it's more like this. You give them all the money, but you're not going to get the bike right then. And they give you a receipt, a redemption ticket. Okay? You come back at an appointed time, you give them that ticket that says you've already paid it all and they give you your bicycle okay well this idea of redemption here is like this Christ died for our sins was buried and rose again he paid for us those that believe that he has the redemption ticket for us we die go to the grave he comes back and in a sense redeems the soul and gives us a body, okay? That's as best as I know how to describe the situation. But God will redeem my soul from what? The power of the grave, for he shall receive me. All right, now, uh, John chapter 5 and verse 26. John chapter 5 and verse 26. This is what the Lord said. 
For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Okay, now, here we have white throne. And I, I can't remember exactly. I think it's like Revelation 20. Yeah, somewhere around Somewhere in there it talks about a white throne, right? And he talks about those that are in hell here that are brought up to this resurrection and judged, and then there's a lake of fire that they're cast into for eternity, all right? Now, that is known as the second resurrection and the second death, right? According to Revelation. All right, now, keeping that in mind, here people say, you see right here, you need to live a good life because if you don't live this good life, you're going to end up going to hell and not being resurrected, okay? Well... We know that not to not to be true. We know that what he's saying here is this. If you, for our, for our case today, if you've trusted the gospel of Christ, believing that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again, you believe that with all of your heart and know that to be true, you would fit into this category that have done good. Mm -hmm. You've done what God's told you in your age, mm -hmm. right? If you reject that, you will be like this person that has done evil. Exactly. And you will go to you will die in that condition, end up here, and you will stay here till the millennial reign comes through. You will be resurrected and judged in this manner. Why didn't you believe the gospel? Someone preached it to you. Someone told you, I sent my spirit to deal with you, and you still rejected it. Mm -hmm. That's what they'll have to deal with. Okay? For us. We're already resurrected here. We're already changed, right? Now, uh, but notice that there are two resurrections, only two that's mentioned in the context here. The first resurrection here, the second, the resurrection of, well, let's, put, let's call it here. This is the resurrection of life, and this one is death. Now, we've gotten this chart that I've drawn here strictly from Scripture that we've just read so far, right? Let's go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Uh, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, And many of them shall sleep in the dust of the earth and shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Sounds like to me that what the Lord just said was a confirmation of the promise made to Daniel back here, right? Let's, let's make a notation here. Daniel says they will sleep. They will die. They will live in the ground or their bodies will. They will sleep in the dust of the earth and shall awake some to everlasting life. This right here. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. Right here. <coughs> and, they shall, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Just let me make this statement here. The wisdom that was given unto the twelve, that was the wisdom that related to these Old Testament prophecies here. The wisdom that's given unto us, that secret wisdom that Christ died for all men, that's the wisdom that he's talking about here. Uh, 
We shall, we shall, I, I put my sh shishes together, we shall shine uh, here as the brightness. Why? Because we're preaching about this resurrected Lord who was brighter than the noonday sun. And when we tell people about that and they say, I believe that, guess what? They shall shine. And notice what he says here. And they that turn many to the righteousness. What do we do when we preach the gospel? We're turning people to righteousness, are we not? Yep. As the stars forever and ever. That's a promise made about us right there. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And you know, we seem like we might be in that time where knowledge is increased, it's covering the earth. I can type something in my phone right now and it can be broadcast across the world in a matter of seconds. And it gets people in trouble. <laughs> uh, some of these things that they type in. But notice, that's interesting. But uh, the key that I want you to see here is that there are these people that sleep, right? And they're awakened. Now, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14 and see if it doesn't sound similar to what we're reading about here. All right. And Paul says that this is comfort to us today. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, I hope you do, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say by the word of the Lord and that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, that word prevent, if I'm not mistaken, means proceed, them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I believe that he's saying this. Job, David, Daniel, all the Old Testament saints, people that have died at the turn of the century, Paul, Timothy, Silas, all of those people are asleep. All right? They are asleep in Christ. And this goes back to this idea that I believe that these people are a part of the body of Christ. Everybody that's ever going to be resurrected here is, is resurrected because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is clear, okay? So if you're going to be a part of this resurrection, you're a part of the body of Christ, period. Now, however you want to divide that up, uh, we can discuss that, but that's clear. All right, so here we have this trump of God. He descends to the earth. These people awake to his likeness. He's saying that if there's people still alive when this happens that are believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, they will be changed just like these people. And Paul's saying that the, these people will not prevent or precede these people. It'll happen so fast, right? But also, and I'm a little hazy on this, but his second coming seems to take a period of time, maybe a 24-hour period, because as the earth is turning, it says every eye shall see him. That's what I'm thinking. I could be wrong about that, okay? But whatever happens pertaining to this resurrection of the, of the just happens in an instant. So he may still be up in the heavens ascending to the earth when this transpires, okay? Because, well, I'll get to that in just a minute, but just bear with me. Um, so, so here we again. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 sounds like the second coming to me based on everything that we've looked at here so far. Now, let's go to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. 
Paul is making a reference to this awakingness, this awaking to being in his likeness. Philippians 3.20 is to Gentiles in the dispensation of the, the grace of God. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall what? Change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Uh, here again, this statement, Jesus Christ is given all authority to do what? To call out those people from their graves and be changed like unto his likeness. Just like as uh, David seen, he would awake to the likeness of, of Christ. Job said, I will stand on the earth and I will see him with my eyes. Paul saying, he will come and change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Sounds just exactly like all that we've been looking at here, right? Let's go to, uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. Now, before we get into that, this passage here, I've used it on a number of times when I preach a funeral. Because here's why. When you are looking at a person that you love laying in a casket and you see that body and you understand that that's merely a tabernacle, a tent. We walk around in this tent, okay? As we get older, this tent gets fatter, doesn't it? And her hair gets all over my, the side of our head. Or some of us lose her hair. And that, that tabernacle gets shabby and it gets, uh, it gets kind of, it, it's not as pretty as it was when we first was young and vibrant, wasn't it, right? I made and, this tabernacle look good. <laughs> Ask Dwayne about how pretty he is. He yeah, was, I hey, think he missed that. <laughs> Dwayne, we're talking about the tabernacle that we walk around in. At, watch it, he's sitting here like this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but notice, you know, there's great comfort here. And then we're, let's look at it. He says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. Sounds like to me what he's saying is this. Just like he says that death eats on our body in the grave that he talked about there in that Old Testament passage. When you die, your body dissolves back to dust from whence it came. And that's God's plan and purpose because there's going to be a time here God says, look, I'm taking care of that situation. That will be no more. O over here after this death, second death's over, they will be no more death. Okay? God will show his authority. I fixed the problem of death. Alright? Mm -hmm. And he says, but... If it's dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. That's hopeful, isn't it? That's hopeful to know that 300 years from now, when my body is just totally dissolved, God's able to reassemble some likeness of me and bring it together. Some people believe that if you know if you're uh, what is it, cremation, uh, that you cast your ashes somewhere that God's not able to bring that back together somehow. Yeah, but, it'd be a little tough for those sailors during World War II to burn up on those ships, wouldn't I'm it? I'm telling you, the, the foolishness of the stuff that goes on, for once it shows ignorance, but two, Paul says we've already got a building of God in the heavens that's already set, as far as God is concerned, as if, you know, you're already res resurrected. If you've been saved, God already sees you as if you're resurrected, okay? It's so real to him. It's so real time, as they say. Well, let me make a comment on that uh, cremation, okay? Well, for one thing, God's not going to bring this flesh back together anyway. Right. We're, this, it was sown an earthly body, and it's going to the grave, and it's turning to dust. Right, exactly. We're going to receive a heavenly body, correct? I agree, yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. But I'm just this idea that some people think 
yeah. that God's not able to fix the problem, as it were, yeah. of the dissolving of a body or, or whatever. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, don't you think, too, that uh, uh, at the great white throne of judgment that maybe he is going to bring their fleshly bodies back before him? Uh, well, they're going to stand in their sinful body? And give an account of themselves before the great white. Yeah, I, well, I hadn't really uh, considered that particular sin, but I would agree with that. But here's the thing that uh, I'm not quite sure what this means. I'll be honest with you, but I have. I'm just going to give you a theory. If that be the case, when they're cast into the lake of fire, where the Lord says, "Where the fire is not quenched." Mm -hmm. and their worm dieth not. Mm -hmm. Whatever that is, I believe that's their soul. Mm -hmm. But that may be their soul without their body. Mm -hmm. So if they're cast in the lake of fire and that flesh is burned up, whatever's left over does not die. Mm -hmm. And they are aware of this eternal situation mm -hmm. forever, okay? So, yeah, that I could yeah. agree. I could see that, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, where we're concerned, we're never going to see, see this situation exactly. right here, exactly. okay? Uh, and, and this is why he says here, For in this, this body, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Sounds like the house is already... This again, this to me again, when you're saved, you're sealed, it's done. There's no going back as far as God's concerned. Your house is already set aside. There is Cindy's house sitting right there. There's Stacy's house. Mm -hmm. It's done, all right? Uh, he says, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Maybe what you're talking about here, when you've got this body up here, if you're cast into the lake of fire, your worm is naked. Mm -hmm. It has no body anymore. It's just, it's in shame, okay? And the reason they're there, I think, I guess the, the point that I want to make, the reason that these people are here is simply because they've allowed Satan to deceive them from simply trusting in the truth. They could have this resurrection, but because they're so blinded by religion or because of their own ideas, their deceitfulness of their heart, they miss out on the greatest gift that's ever been given, mm -hmm. a free gift. It's, it, you know, that's what would I think would be so frustrating here is to stand before the Lord and know that I could have had this free gift, but I chose to believe a falsehood. And I would be so angry at Satan and Lucifer, and he's going to be there with me. Yeah. Okay? But anyway, when he says... Clothed, we shall not be found naked. Why? For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. For we, for not that we would be unclothed, but be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in victory. And I think what he's saying there is this. We don't long to just die and go into the dirt. We know we're going to die. We long for that resurrection is what he's saying there. Mm -hmm. That we would be clothed upon that that resurrection would happen soon is what he's saying there. Not now. He that hath wrought us for the self same thing as God who hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. There's that, that idea. He's given you the Holy Spirit as a saved individual as proof that you're going to be resurrected. Okay, that earnest money, that redemption ticket. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. And that means to me, when you're absent from this body, as a saved individual, you're present with the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever that means, I don't say I got all a handle on that, but you're in His presence, okay? And I don't think you know what's going on down here on earth. And I think that if you did know, there wouldn't be peace. Yep. Uh, if you had, for example, if you had children that you left and they weren't being treated right, 
you would be in you would be uh, not at peace in the presence of the Lord. Go ahead. You know, I, uh, I, these people that say stuff like, "Well, my dad's up there in heaven looking down at me today." You know, they don't right. know what they're talking about. Right. Uh, if if you would actually consider these things, uh, what we get the problem. That, that faces us just like Paul said there in Ephesians we're carried about by every wind of doctrine that comes down the pike that says these things okay uh, the reason that I think that again you would not be at peace in heaven if you knew all the stuff that's going on down here you'd be worried about your loved ones I mean it even if even if my kids were took care of, I would worry about all the stuff that's going on in the world right now. They're going to be able to be all right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But we're at peace with the Lord because he's taking care of the situation. All right, now let's go uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. Okay. Uh, Okay, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, the mystery here is this. Not that there's going to be uh, uh, a changing, okay, because we've proved from back here, mm -hmm. there's going to be a change back here that they knew about. Mm -hmm. So the secret is this, that the people that are still standing at the resurrection that are justified because they believe the truth, that they will be changed, that they won't go through death. That's the secret here, okay? Mm -hmm. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we, we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. What is he talking about? He's talking about that tabernacle that's been promised that he just mentioned here in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.1. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this happens, when this corruptible shall have put on incorrupt incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory okay we're going to look at that but notice at this resurrection the word of God said death is swallowed up in victory why because that those bodies those people that were under the power of death the fear of death death has no more hold on them anymore Right. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 7 because Paul quoted that verse and let's just see if we can get any further context from it. 25 uh, Verse 7. All right. Uh, and he says, He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast uh, over all people. Notice that that veil is over all people and the veil is spread, spread over nations. Now when he says this mountain here, I think that is a reference to Mount Zion. Is it, or Mount Olive, I'm sorry. It is Mount Olivet and where he comes back in his second coming. It says his feet shall land, stand upon that mountain, right? And it seems that when he stands on that mountain that there's such a force that it splits. There's a great chasm that's broken as a result of that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but notice there is a, let's, let's put it this way. I'm just going to use a different word here. A spell has been cast on the people and the nations by Lucifer. He's blinded them, right? He says, I will destroy this mountain in this mountain the face 
of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death and victory, the resurrection, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the rebuke of his people, that is Israel, shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And that's, of course, over here in the kingdom, Israel, you know, they're dwelling in safety now, okay? And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him. Sounds like those people that are still standing there, does it, at the second coming. We've waited for Him, and He shall save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in this salvation. I'm not going to go there right now. I can't remember the exact passage right yet, but the Lord said, when he was talking to his disciples, he says, when you see this city, being Jerusalem, compassed about by the, by the armies of the Gentiles, he says, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Mm -hmm. Sounds like these people would be saying, oh, what's going on? We need some help. We need a deliverer. And he shows up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let's go to John chapter 11, and I'll close with this thought. Uh, we'll pick up next week. Uh, John chapter 11 and verse 23. Now, we remember that the Lord said that He will call out and the graves will be opened. There will be those that will be resurrected to life and then there will be those that will later on be resurrected to uh, damnation or judgment and shame. Now, notice here. I love this story right here because this is a picture of the power of the Lord and he used it as, as such. We all know that Lazarus, they, uh, Jesus and his disciples were away. Lazarus died. The Lord knew it. Uh, he told his disciples, hey, Lazarus is asleep. And they say, well, that's good. <laughs> you know, it's good. I like to take a nap and get a rest. You know, that's what they, he thought he was talking about there. And he says no, and they go on, right? And he's already been dead for, uh, I think, four days by the time he gets there, right? Uh, and, and here again, I don't know all the details pertaining to this, but it seems after the third day that corruption takes complete control. The body is totally starting to deteriorate by then, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's where that corruption idea comes in. Jesus was raised after the third day. He didn't see corruption. All right? Jesus saith unto her, Martha, thy breath, well, she says to him, Lord, if you'd been here, he would not have died. Okay? He says, Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Notice what she says to him. Martha, Martha saith unto him, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She understood this right here. This right here, look at me. The resurrection of the last day is what he's talking about. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? And she says, Say unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which shall come into the world. That is the gospel in a nutshell for them and for those coming after us. Okay? They're going to believe that Jesus was the Christ coming back. The Antichrist is going to have them believe that he's the one that came back and that he is now the Messiah. They will believe the lie, the, uh, the nation of Israel will. And also, the Gentile nations will believe something about this guy, okay? But they will believe that lie and take that mark. Now, notice, there's a resurrection only once mentioned at the last day. There's no secret resurrection before, but it's this, all right? Now, I love this. This applies to us. If you've trusted the gospel of Christ, you will be resurrected into life. There is no doubt about it. You will receive this body. You have an inheritance. 
in the heavens. And there's an inheritance coming in over here in some respects. What we do in this life pertaining to the gospel of Christ, what we do pertaining to helping people see the truth of the gospel, over here we'll get some, and I'm talking about eternally, but we will help over here in some way. I don't know what all, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't know all that, but I am studying that stuff right now, trying to get a handle on it. Okay? Now, let me just real quickly go over. There is a resurrection where those saints will awake to His likeness. They will stand on the earth. They will see the Lord. They're, they sleep. They sleep in Jesus. And they're raised. They're, that resurrection is called death being swallowed up in victory. The mourning. The redemption. I mean, it's all good stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And something to look forward to. The second resurrection is the second death. And we'll talk about that next week and uh, kind of go through all that and kind of document it. But I hope that this has been encouraging to you. I hope it's been enlightening to you and I appreciate your time. Thank you.